Hey, what's going on, folks? It's a midweek drop of the Stickbow Chronicles brought to you by Black Widow Bows. I'm Rob Petuto, and the band's back together. What's up, Blake? What's up, man? Oh, man, middle of the week, middle of the work week. It's amazing that uh, you and I both got time to sit down and do this. <laughs> I know, it's pretty rare. Pretty rare, it seems like. You know, I thought my schedule was a moving target. <laughs> Yeah, mine's horrible. They just, I might get a call in 10 minutes when we get done doing this, but. That's got to be awesome. That you, It'd be like a first responder. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not far from that other than the, you know, the job description, but the schedule's uh, pretty similar anyway. You're not, you're not saving lives. You're appeasing people. Yeah, I'm putting, putting gas in people's tanks. So there you go. Doing, doing something. Keep keeping us energy, um, energy independent. That's I like right. It. I like it. Um, so anyways, yeah, we got a special midweek drop here. Uh, we got a guy from Texas right down the road from you, right? Yeah. Fellow Texas boy. Uh, stick bow guy. He's been a long time, uh, supporter of the show and I've leaned on him for technical advice quite a bit. Um, it's Cameron Hale and he has, and he's a real podcaster, not like what you and I do. <laughs> he's like a real <laughs> podcaster. <laughs> Uh, no, he, he's got a, he's got a cool podcast and, uh, you know, super nice guy and super interesting guy. He's very easy to listen to and, uh, tells a good story. Yeah. Me and my kid, um, I don't know, early last summer, probably springtime, we got turned on to his podcast, expanded perspectives. And if you're as old as I am, you'll remember the TV show, uh, what is it in search in search of. You know, it's like um, Bermuda Triangle stuff and unexplained mysteries and stuff. And that's what the expanded perspectives is all about. And I, we, we talk about that story about the, uh, the what, what do you say, 18-inch tall Native Americans? Yeah. The Wendy's? Yeah. I mean, dude, I, really, I get into that stuff. But <laughs> I'm telling you, man, when I'm like walking for an hour and a half in the dark <laughs> or, uh, you know, sleeping out, um, yeah, that's stuff... I got an overactive imagination. I don't want a lot of that stuff in my head. I've had a creepy night or two in the woods, uh, late getting back to the truck or something like that. Uh, I can't help but remember the story that um, um, Monty Browning tells. One of my favorite stories about when he was he was hunting in that uh, in that cemetery right around Halloween, and he gets in his truck and his safety harness was hanging out the the door, and he didn't know it, and some unexplained force is trying to rip him out of the truck because he's driving down the road. <laughs> uh, so, uh, oh, that's funny. That's too funny. Well, if there's a group of folks that are going to have uh, weird happenings and, you know, unexplained events and you know, even missing people, uh, it's going to be hunters. So we figured for Halloween, um, this would be a great episode, kind of a, just a fun shoot the breeze and, uh, yeah, explore the unexplainable. No, I had fun. It was interesting. And like I said earlier, listening to Cameron tell stories is just fun in general. So, um, he's a real storyteller. <laughs> he's very, yeah, he's good at it. And like you said, uh, you know, uh, hunters are going to have stranger experiences and probably most people just because of the time spent in the places that we spend it. So, um, one, no, it was cool. Yeah. One thing that we touch on, uh, first off, you ever had anything weird, like unexplained happen? No, I haven't. I've, like I said, I've had a few, probably two that I can think of off the top of my head where I've gotten turned around in the dark and super thick timber and just creepy nights, but I, I've never had anything happen that was just too off the wall anyway. No. Not anything like what we talk about in this episode. <laughs> no, no, I haven't either. I, I, um, I can't, I can't think of anything that was unexplained. I mean, you, like you said, you get a little creeped out sometimes. Um, I do have a friend. Now, one of the things that comes up in this episode is how do you explain it when it happens to people that you know, right? So you hear these stories and you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, he's a freaking crackhead or whatever. But, uh, when it happens to somebody that you know, and I'll tell you, man, I got a guy that, uh, was longtime friends with, I haven't been in touch with him in a few years. I trust the guy. I mean, I trust him with my life. The guy ain't a liar, but one night we were just, uh, we were, we were hunting and we were shooting crap there in the tent and 
the subject of UFOs came up and I said, you believe in UFOs? And without hesitation, and so I'd known him for probably near 10 years before this and without hesitation, he says, oh, hell yeah. And he goes on for 45 minutes about, um, not just once, he was working a night shift. He worked night shift often. He was up in northeastern Washington and uh, kind of a kind of a very, very rural setting and um, absolutely unequivocally laid out how it was often that he would be driving home and he'd see these uh, lights zipping across the sky and hovering. And, and I was floored. I was floored that he was just like dumping this on me because he'd never said a word. And I brought it up, and boom, yeah, it was just like it was a fact. So, <laughs> well, like we talked about in the podcast, I believe if I remember right, is there's probably a lot of people who've seen some really weird stuff that just don't tell anybody. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and unless somebody asks them about it, you know. Yeah, um, and I I posted um, I just posted something on Facebook, you know, announcing that we're going to have this uh, bonus episode, kind of a Halloween thing, fun thing. And I just, I threw it out there. Anybody ever have anything, have anything happen unexplainable? Well, you, we're, we're going to get all kinds of, you know, jokes and stuff, but there's, there's going to be a handful of people out there that aren't going to respond because they don't want to be a target. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of the things he was explaining, if I had experienced something like that, I don't know if I'd tell anybody because, <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds crazy, but, um, you know, like he said, and you know, you'll hear this in the episode, but it doesn't matter whether or not you believe it. The person who saw it obviously believes it. Yeah. And, uh, like you said, the one guy sells all his stuff and, uh, and quits hunting and never hunts again. I mean, yep. <laughs> um, yeah. So what else you got going on? You've been, uh, you've been starting to hunt again, right? Yeah. I just, uh, I've hunted twice now and I've actually hunted twice and seen two good bucks. So I guess I need to retire cause that never happens. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I went and hunted a couple of days ago. I was going to go try and shoot a doe and, uh, saw three bucks. One of them was a pretty good one. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, the next few weeks I'm going to try and hit it hard and I've got one more buck tag on another place that I can shoot, uh, here in Texas. And then, if I can fill that one, I'll probably go and uh, hunt some public land up in Oklahoma. That was th that video you posted was kind of low light, uh, but that mm -hmm. looked like a hell of a buck. Yeah, he's he's really framey. I actually I had him at like fourteen yards last year. He was just an eight point, but he's this year he's a ten. He's got a split G two on his left side, and then got a little kicker off his brow tine on the other side. He's he's a solid solid buck. He's probably right around 150 if I was guessing, but, uh, for main, main, mainframe eight point, that's a, you know, that's a hell of a deer. You got a big frame. Mm -hmm. I, um, I got pretty excited. I, yesterday, uh, well, two days ago, I, I'd, I'd hunted for just for an hour and a half or something. And, and I posted on there, like get up my stand, you know, it's a long walk in there. You get all set up and I, I get there and I don't have a safety rope. Uh, so I've got my harness, but I don't have a rope. And I usually leave a rope in a tree, so I, I, I can't believe that I didn't. But I didn't leave a rope, I didn't leave a haul line, and I didn't leave a bow hook. So I don't know what I was thinking early October when I set that stand. But, well, I, you know, you, you go in there that far, I'm like, nah, I'm hunting. I don't care. <laughs> so I get up there, and it was an uncomfortable hour, hour and a half, pretty much hugging that tree. And I had uh, some phony little hook that I had my bow on. And when my bow knocked out of the tree and hit the ground. It's like, you know, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to call Probably it a sign. Yeah. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> y'all hunt, y'all hunt way high too. Y'all hunt like up over 20, 25 foot. Don't you? Um, I don't, you know, I never measured it. I don't think I'm much, eh, probably 20. I don't think I ever hit 25. Although I will say, um, I have oftentimes have stands on a steep hill. So, you know, on the low side, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. 25, sometimes 30 feet on the low side. I, I've got one stand that's up about 25 foot and it makes me nervous sitting in it. That's any more, which I'm spoiled. You know, I can put stands up and leave them up. I don't have to take them down or anything like that. So I usually hunt out of ladder stands and I just feel much more comfortable in a ladder stand than I do hang ons up high. But 
um, yeah. Well, the, the good thing that happened was when I got out, you know, uh, still plenty of, of good day hunting there. And so I hiked over the, uh, I hiked over the ridge down into another piece of the ground there, um, uh, that I used to hunt and they had logged the piss out of it about a dozen years ago. And so it, the portion that wasn't logged, um, I was kind of just cruising through there. We had a little tra- a little snow, we got about three or four inches of snow on the ground. And I was shocked at the deer sign. I mean, shocked. I don't see that in the mountains very often. So I snuck in there yesterday and, and hung a stand and I'm pretty stoked. Maybe Friday evening, I'll get in that. Yeah. That, uh, you were telling me about that earlier. Um, I guess out there, I mean, you're, you're counting it as a win if you just go and see a deer in a spot a lot of times. So oh. seeing a lot of sign on one spot like that, I'm sure it was a pretty big deal. Yeah. I mean, I, I did see a doe that day and, and I was telling you about, you know, being more conscious of my scent. Uh, and so I was able to, you know, I wash my clothes. I carried them in in a dry bag uh, got changed in there, um, before I got in the tree and, and I was able to watch this doe come in downwind and, um, uh, it didn't full on sell out. You know, I think about this too. So hunting in the mountains, think of how many times in a year a deer smells a human in the mountains and opposed to like, I got some acreage behind my house that I hunt once in a while. A deer back there might smell a human a couple times a week, maybe. Right? Yeah, or more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just got to thinking, you know, uh, how important it is if I blow one deer out or if a deer gets even a hint of a human scent up in the mountains, I mean, it's going to be a total different, I would think, a total different reaction than, say, one, you know, in a little more rural or a little more suburban setting. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's probably spot on. I mean, it, you know, I, I get pretty wound up and scent control and uh, you know i i just i spent a lot of time around you know due to you know where i hunt i I spent a lot of time around a lot of deer and i just you know i know i've said it on here before probably but i can physically see a difference in in deer's reactions and deer's behavior from when i am doing my best to to control my scent when i'm not so I mean, I, I'm a big believer in it. I know a lot of people say hunt the wind, hunt the wind, hunt the wind. But, I mean, deer, if they can use the wind to their advantage, they're going to. So, you know, that's that's kind of the thought process I have anyway. Um, you know, I'm ever-evolving. I am not a uh, whitetail guru by any means. It's been really awesome to have uh, a couple guys like Troy Pottinger and Nathan Killen on, kind of speaking more to what I do. But Mm -hmm. I get so jealous this time of year when I see um, all you guys posting, like, you know, Brian Burkhardt, he's always putting up photos like, oh, let this little guy walk, you know, show like a a fork and horn or a three point walk and understand. I'm thinking, shoot, man, (laughs) shoot, are you kidding (laughs) me? (laughs) And I need to, I need to kind of take a step back and be a little bit more careful when I do post stuff. Cause I, you know, I, I know that I'm fortunate to hunt where I hunt and have the, the deer numbers and, and things like that, which is, it's not anything like certain parts of Texas, but it's certainly, you know, I expect to, you know, at least see one deer every time I go and sit. Now I, I get skunked probably 20, 30% of the time, but you know, I, I, uh, I guess want to clarify that I understand that uh, I'm very fortunate to, to hunt where I hunt. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm turning my nose up at deer or anything like that. Cause if I was hunting, uh, she was on the other foot and I was hunting somewhere else, public land or whatever, I'd probably shoot the first damn thing walked under me. So. <laughs> well, um, uh, like Jim Eckout, right. He's, he killed a man. I was a tank doe. He shot yeah, the other day. 100%. And, yeah. And then he shoots that big bodied. I don't know. Was it a, I think you guys call them eight points or something, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I, no, I saw that one. Yeah, I was listening to the push where they did an episode with Logan uh, on his buck, and and Tim Neville he throws out something like, "Yeah, I saw, I forget the number, 
how many bucks he saw in a day. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Idaho is not all what it's cracked up to be when it comes to bow hunting. <laughs> but y'all got some big bucks, man. I've been really, uh, you know, seeing some of the bucks that Troy posts, there's some really quality animals in Idaho. And I've never associated Idaho with being a whitetail state. Well, I'll tell you, um, I think I've gone through this before. Uh, number one, I, I killed a, a 172 some years ago. Um, I have a buddy that has sheds in his gun safe, uh, a match set that I know the one side scored over 92 inches. Wow. Um, yeah. and there was a 200 inch buck killed, uh, I think it was like 207 or 210, somewhere in there, um, uh, just about a mile and a half north of me. Uh, Mm -hmm. it used to be, and I've said this before, and I actually get some people like pushing back on me, always hacking on the fishing game. I don't always hack on our fishing game, uh, but I know right from wrong and, and I have good relationship with them and I voice my opinion. Um, they have absolutely screwed up our bucks, um, our age structure, right? Cause we, cause they're rifle hunting bucks from October it's either 5th or 10th to December 1. Really? Uh, it opens in October? Yes. Good grief. And, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah, and uh, they did put out some doe tags, I don't know, probably six, seven years ago, they put out some controlled hunt doe tags. But So you're walking around with a, you know, a tag in your pocket for uh, a month and a half, and what does everybody do? You know, you like, wait to see. So now you're, you're hunting right through the peak of the rut uh, when all these bucks get stupid. And it's evidence, Arrival. yeah, and it's evidence through um, our gun and horn show. Uh, it used to be our gun and horn show. It used to be fantastic with uh, monster. Well, I say monster. I throw that around. I mean, it was nothing to see 140s, 150s, 160s, you know, 180s. Yeah, those are solid bucks anywhere. Oh, man. In the Midwest, those yeah. are solid bucks. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll tell you, um, I travel some pretty hazardous roads to get to work. You know, it's... I don't know, 30, 35 miles of uh, highway and it's all good deer habitat. And we used, to, you know, you used to see bucks stand on the mm-hmm. side of the road during the ride or you see roadkill. Man, I try to tell them that uh, you need to back the rifle season off. And I'm not just, I'm not the only one. Uh, there's guys that are really into whitetails that have game cameras out year round uh, that say the same thing. Like, and Idaho has really, really missed. I'm uh, speaking specifically of northern idaho uh really Mm -hmm. missed the boat on uh whitetail management yeah when you've got a resource like that it's uh, you know you'd like to see people take some initiative to protect it and uh, you know maybe that's why i I get confused for maybe being a little snobby or whatever and passing on deer but i just i know the resource that we've got and shooting shooting younger bucks is uh, I guess it's not much of a challenge or whatever because we've got so many of them and you're not helping your resource any by doing that. And, uh, you know, being able to hunt with a rifle throughout October kind of blows my mind a little bit. So, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's when our big bucks are getting killed in October. I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, incidentals, right? So somebody, uh, might have a deer tag in their pocket and they're not going to really hit it hard till november but they see that one good buck standing out in somebody's field and boom it's dead well yeah that's kind of more what i was saying which you're hunting in the mountains i've got to keep that in mind i'm thinking more like uh, catching bucks in their summer feeding patterns but if you're hunting them in the mountains obviously that's a little bit different ball well, game but you know i talk I about i talk about the mountains often but if anybody knows uh northern idaho there's a lot of um you know, like bonners ferry all the way down um down through sandpoint there are uh, big tracts of private land, agricultural hay fields and stuff like that. I don't uh, have permission or, you know, I don't really look for permission to hunt any of that stuff. So, uh, and actually, you know, we're getting on a, on a tear here. Um, there used to be a, or there still is a, a hunt, controlled hunt you can draw oh, August 30th through the month of September. And it was initially, it was for high country mule deer and they'd put out a handful of tags. Well, through over time, that's, uh, morphed into, you know, you draw that tag, you're shooting a, a hay field, 
you know, monster white tail. Yeah. 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 So I just think it they could do a much better job managing. And I'm not talking, I'm not a trophy hunter, but I'm talking mature bucks, just like age structure. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's all, that's all, every, that's all I want anywhere I go. I, I'm not going and saying I'm holding out for a 180 buck or anything like that. I just want to shoot a good old buck. You know, that's, that's what I get excited about regardless of, you know, how big the, the rack is. Well, it's a general season, uh, October. I'm screwing that up. I'm a fifth of the 10th. I don't pay much attention, uh, to December one. It's a general season. So that's when I'm, uh, bow hunting, uh, cause you can, and, right. um, I don't know where I'm going with that other than, uh, just be safe out there. I always throw the tip out. I, 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 I throw this tip out. If you're, you know, when you're hunting, you're heading to your stand, uh, or from your stand, low light conditions. I'm a big, um, big advocate of turning. Orange. Well, not just the orange, but in it, actually in Idaho, it's not required. Um, uh, headlamp. You might not need that light to see, but turn that damn thing on because I can see where I'm walking. But, you know, we got, uh, 10 year olds out there that can hunt when they're 10. And, uh, so just be safe out there. Take every precaution. I really, uh, think that, a headlamp's a good idea in low light conditions. Hundred percent. Well, we kind of rambled there, buddy. That's okay. I like talking white tails, man. Well, <laughs> uh, cool. Um, let's uh, thank the sponsors for helping us put this together every week. Uh, great companies out there: Kafaru International, The Footed Shaft, Iron Will Outfitters, Selway Archery, and of course Black Widow Bows. We appreciate them. If you like the show, you listen to it. Like, follow the show, you know, hit that follow button, pass it on, and thank the sponsors. You got anything else? Give us a review on iTunes too. That that really helps. Go go give us a, a you know a good review if it's good. Uh, well, don't don't leave us bad reviews. Just keep your opinion to yourself. <laughs> if that's the case. Yeah. But... <laughs> we only want good opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I only want ones that make me warm and fuzzy. And that's it. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's that comes with your age, though. That's your generation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish oh. the listeners could see that. Yeah, parting shot right there. <laughs> all right, man. You guys all be safe. We'll talk to you next Monday. This is just a bonus episode. You got anything else? Uh, no, that's it, man. All right. All right, so we've got uh, we've got Cameron Hale on here from Expanded Perspectives. What's going on, buddy? What's happening, man? I'm sorry I don't have the video working. I'm not good at that yet. <laughs> You're good, man. No worries. <laughs> I can't. Honestly, I was looking, and I'm like, man, I feel left out. I'm looking around. I can't. I, I have one. I promise. The little plug-in, like, webcam, but I have no idea where it's at. I've spent the last 30 minutes turning this place upside down, so... That's all. I, I don't really have anything awesome other than that. So you, uh, you've been a huge help. I got to thank you on here. Uh, yeah, you've been a huge help for technical stuff and, uh, you know, just coaching me and uh, coaching me along all this technical stuff. So I really appreciate it. It's the fun. It's stuff that I had to learn the hard way whenever I started. So, cause there was nothing out there. We started podcasting in 2013. So literally you could barely find anything even on uh, YouTube as we were laughing off air about, uh, that would point you in the right direction. So everything that we learned, I got lucky because literally my next, can I say literally enough? Honestly, my next door neighbor is a uh, audio engineer professionally, has been for 34, 35 years. His name's Tim Kimsey. And you can go on there. I think he's got his own Wikipedia page. He's got his own, all that stuff. And he's done a bunch of different albums. And that was the man that I leaned on learning how to do this to show me how to set all this stuff up. And then when I got that going and then Kyle and I, the other guy I podcast with just trying out all this other stuff. So whenever I was talking to you, you told me what you got going on. I'm like, Ooh, I can help you out with that. I know where this is going from here. Yeah. Um, and so to tell, tell listeners a little bit about uh, expanded perspectives. So what we started doing was a podcast about all the things that you really enjoy, but you don't want your friends to know that you enjoy. <laughs> like like uh, riding mopeds. <laughs> that's exactly yeah, 100%. Yeah. So what it is, is we do all the strange and unusual topics. Like I said, we started back in 2013. We still do it every week, two shows a week. Uh, we talk about Bigfoot, 
aliens, missing people, serial killers, crazy ghost sightings, dog man, werewolf. It doesn't matter what it is. The wild, crazy stories and all the folklore that goes in from not just in America, but around the world. We've covered stories from Japan to New Zealand to Peru. Doesn't matter. We've done ancient history. We've interviewed all the people that you've probably seen or heard of on other big podcasts. We've talked to all those people, but we've literally pumped all those stories out because it's something that's fun. And it was just something that I've always enjoyed reading about. I get this question a lot and we'll go ahead and bridge that right now. Everyone always asks, do you believe in aliens? Do you believe in Bigfoot? I answer the same thing. I don't know. I have no idea. I, I don't know what's out there. I read both sides. You, you try to study what, how it could possibly be. No way. No way. There's a breeding population of Bigfoot. No way. But then you read all these other stories, these encounters and stuff, and you meet the people that have had these alleged sightings and you see how much it changes those people. So you see both sides and it's like I said, I've drawn to the middle. So I don't know. And that's the way we approach the podcast is with the, well, I don't know, but here's the story. So I'm not there or we're not there to put all that information out and try to force you to believe one way or the other. We are just old school storytellers spinning a yarn, sitting around the campfire. We're going to tell you the stories this is the folklore we've heard. This is some of the history behind the folklore. And this is where the story goes. And it's up to you. You can believe it if you want to or not. It's either way. So that's kind of how we've approached doing the podcast this whole time. Well, I enjoy it. I, me and my boy listen to it. Uh, we do doing little road trips and stuff. And I, I, like the, I like the one you did when you did about the little Indians there. And, and yeah, uh, that was a good one. That's another one of those stories that I know the guy. Like the guy that told me the story, I know him very well. And there's part of that story that I've really not told a lot of people. And part of that story is I've been on that, that ranch where all this went down. I've actually been on there and spent some time hunting back in the nineties on that place. So I know when he starts describing it and I, I know exactly where he's talking about. And he's just one of those guys. I'm glad you brought this up. This is the perfect example of this is we've all got everybody listening has got a hunting buddy or has some friends or some older guys, you know, like what is it, the old crusties that you look up to that are no nonsense, just guys that they just don't put up with any of the, the silliness. They don't watch Marvel movies. You know, they don't, Oh, that's ridiculous. You know, it's just one of those. I'm not watching anything unless it has to do with like good, like hard work, clean living movies. And that's kind of the way he lives his life. So for him to tell me, that story and it to be honest and flowing from him like that it really meant a lot uh and it i'll i guess i better go ahead and tell everybody what you're talking about i had a friend of mine that hunts in south texas and it's outside i tell her about it's but it's down around in the ozona area of south texas and like i said i've hunted on it multiple times and he had encounters that lasted three different encounters lasted over a span of like six or seven years with tiny 18 inch tall Native Americans. Now, when I say encounters, I use it loosely. There was only one that was a true encounter. And the first story, I guess, of what he first noticed happening, you really couldn't call an encounter. But what ended up happening was they noticed, long and short of it, they noticed something was getting into one of their sheds where they had had built down there where they'd stored corn and kept like tools and a couple of four wheelers, I believe, parked in there and, and just a bunch of stuff, just like an old tin building that they had built just to keep covered. And they had noticed things were missing. And, and it was always the joke, and it's always the running joke, and it actually plays into part of this story, is they were missing like some sockets, you know, and, and like something, just stuff that you would fix on your four-wheeler or keep down there to work on, you know, stand legs, feeder legs, whatever you got, just small amount of tools. Well, they had noticed a few things missing, like the cap off of like a, a, a bottle of wasp spray, just the lid was missing or and they were missing like sockets, just little things, you know, maybe like a machete or an ax, something like that went missing, but nothing not like you were people had broken into the house, just things that you wouldn't normally notice unless you just till you needed it. And then afterwards, it had gone on like a season or so, and he was in a, a ground blind and had noticed glassing over on the backside, north side kind of uh, of his place, glassing where you could see off onto the neighboring ranch's place there was always a trail and you said, you know, you could see Havelina, you would see stuff moving through there all the time. This trail was a good little clip over there. 
and he saw what he thought were javelina and he pulled up his glasses and got to look in, and the only thing that he could describe it as was three elderly native americans couldn't have been more than maybe 18 to 20 inches tall and they were wearing like furs of some kind one of them had like a walking stick like it looked older and they were making their way up that path and went right over it and he said again he goes, I don't even know what I was looking at. Where I was at, you would have to walk to get in there to this part of the ranch anyway. But he said that if you hadn't pulled your glasses up and it just kind of thought that they were, you know, maybe pigs, javelina, something along those lines, whatever, raccoons, didn't matter. It would have easily have passed for that. It wasn't until he got to study and he's like, that's not what I thought it was. Then you have to fast forward that there was a water trough in the ground. And at one point in time, he had found what he thought were toddler tracks around this water trough. He said they were very small footprints. And so he looked all around thinking, you know, how did a baby get out here? How did a toddler or a kid get out here? What's going on? You know, and then you start having these ideas of, could it have been an illegal? Is it a family of illegals? And one of them had passed. And then the child's the only one that's left. Like you have all these ideas running through your head. You have, so he looks and can never find it and loses the tracks off in the grass, thinks nothing of it. It's not until later on in turkey season where he's actually on the place and trying to kill some turkey in this area and sees some toms and it's a dry creek bed, little sandy creek bed that he drops off in and starts working his way down using it as cover and tells the story that he came around a turn and came face to face with like three 18 inch tall said one of them was actually had like a rabbit over its shoulder like tied on the feet where you could carry it. They were all carrying little weapons, this whole thing. And he said there were three of them, like they were three men that were out in like a little hunting party. And he said, I was 20 yards from them at best. You know, not even that, like just right there. And he said he just kind of froze and he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He's like, your senses don't even register when these things are happening. He's like, you don't pay any attention to the wind, the noises, anything. You just kind of freeze. And he said he didn't really know what to do. So he just kind of nodded at him. He's in full camo. He just nodded at him and walked away, stayed crouched and just worked his way down the creek like he was going hunting. And he said they kind of moved off and he come out of there, ended up working his way back to his mountain bike, got on it, biked back to camp. And that's been, man, I forgot what year he said that was again now. Maybe 20, oh, I don't remember. But it's been a few, a few years and he even talks now. He's like, I've not, since that day, I've had no encounter, no sign, no anything. He's like, it's almost like when that encounter happened, whatever was there is gone. <laughs> That's wild. So has there ever been any other uh, stories like this come around? Is, is, is this kind of one in a million or? Oh, no, no. There are, a, there are numerous stories through South America and even in South Texas. Uh, they have what, what, what people consider as a fey folk or like, uh, like yard gnomes. Everybody has the idea of like the Travelocity gnome, right? So when you see that, that's the idea of a fairy or a fae is what they call them. Well, in South America and down in Brazil, they're known as Dwindy, but they look different. They're more of a brownie style that you would see. So like the brown pants, the like, uh, like you see like the felt tops, they're a little darker complected beards, and these are more mischievous. They're not the reports that people have had of these. And this has been going on for years because it all, of course, have started in Scandinavian folklore. But when you come over here to North America, it's even in the Native American folklore where they talk about these spirits of the woods. And so a lot of this traces back as you go through a lot of the, the South American natives and whatnot through all their lineage too, of these tales of the Duende, of the Duende will take your kids, the Duende will lead you into the woods and confuse you. And, and it's always been the tale if you read children's stories growing up is you can't eat the food or drink the water that the fey folk want to give you, the fairy or whatever it is, because they're more known as tricksters. So this Dwindy uh, name and, and this whole character works its way up even into South Texas. So when you hear these stories of Dwindies in Texas, that's normally what you get is it's kind of like native, tiny native American people or uh, yeah, almost like cavemen sometimes even when they see the skins that they're wearing, there was a report out of Colorado we had a, a listener call, call us or actually send us a big email about he was on a uh, surveying crew with three Brazilian men, four Brazilian men, and they were up in on a ranch in Colorado. And 
while they were doing the surveying, they thought they saw a family of raccoons, like four or five in a row, go up a trail. So these Brazilian guys had never seen raccoons. So they take off after it. Well, the next thing you know, this, the guy that wrote it in, he's with them and they all start screaming and come back. And all they're saying is Dwindy. Well, this is before he even knew what they were. These men left the job, went back down to the job site trailer and wouldn't leave it. Ended up losing their jobs because they wouldn't go back up in the seismic crew area because they said that that valley was inhabited by Dwindy. And what he finally got from the interpreter was that they had seen a group of small, looked like pre-Diluvian cavemen that had little skins on, little walking sticks, little packs, all this as they were hiking their way through this valley. So, yeah, there's all kinds of wild stories that come up with Dwindy and, and little, little people of the woods like that. I feel like this is going to end up being a shot at my height. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, right. Yeah. Be this tall to not, not maybe, have to wear. The maybe I'm a hat. tall Dwendy. That's it. Yes, <laughs> the world's the tallest dwarf, or the world's that's smallest a, giant. That's a claim to fame, right there, Rob. Right there. <laughs> I think I've seen that actually at like uh, one of those Carson and Barnes circuses back in the day, or the the Texas State Fair when they used to actually have the the show lined up, or the people lined up, where you could go pay to see them. So you said in the beginning, do you say you guys do two shows a week? Yes, sir. Holy smokes. Yes, sir. A lot of reading. That's a lot of work. It's not bad. No Once you get to go and it's, I mean, it's one of those deals that it's, it's all there. You just have to, you know, tell the stories, put it together. <laughs> well, you and I have talked quite a bit and talked at length and, um, Halloween was coming up and, uh, <laughs> If anybody spent as much time out in the woods as, as hunters, bow hunters, uh, we all have seen and, and uh, heard and, you know, you, lots of stories and some weird stuff. So we thought of Halloween would be a pretty good one. What, you know, <clears throat> pretty good time for this episode. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you want to talk about? We can go down any path. Like I was giving you a hard time about, uh, what Rob doesn't know is uh, up in the county that he lives in is actually one of the most reported counties in the state of Idaho for Bigfoot sightings, which is really pretty fun. So I'm sure R Rob's going to get a load out of some of those because you've probably known the area. Oh, of absolutely. Some of the You're, yeah. You already told me a couple places. I'm like, yeah, yep. Yep. Of yep. <laughs> What's so fun about this? And it's the way I approach it. So everybody always asks, you know, uh, about the whole thing. So I guess I even, I kind of skipped past that too. I got to listening to these, these fellas here because of being obsessed with, of course, traditional archery. I started shooting a bow when I was three. I started bow hunting by myself when I was 12, and I've not stopped. I had a traditional bow and shot recurves up until I bought my first compound when I was 12. And then I shot that up until, when did I get my first long? But three years ago. Three years ago, I made the switch to messing around with trad. And then 2018 into 2017, 2018 full trad trad life full trad <laughs> and so gave away all my compound bows got rid of everything went just straight stick on that whole deal so listening to this whole thing yeah that, that's how i ended up finding rob and and then we ended up conversing and then that's how y'all are stuck with me for the next hour so buckle <laughs> up it's time to get wild so it, 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 before you get rolling you gotta yeah. give you you gotta give your son a shout out oh yeah yeah. So we went to Arizona, me and the buddy of mine, a podcast with, which he's a trad guy. And then my son, uh, this January, we went to Arizona on a mule deer hunt. So we go out there, wasn't successful, saw some, just wasn't successful, but he took his compound, did all that. But the whole time we were out there, he was mad because he was lugging it around. He's like, man, this is heavy. I'm like, yeah, this ain't. And just kept on and kept on. And we're shooting yucca plants. You know, it's just fun. You walk around shooting around a stump shooting. It's a blast. Well, come back. February, he buys his first recurve, dedicates himself to it, starts going to some 3D shoots. Of course, COVID happens, kind of shuts that stuff down. And then two weeks ago, he ends, well, opening weekend. It was opening day that evening here in Texas. So October 3rd? That went in, yeah, October 3rd this year. That right. evening, Bobcat comes in. He shoots a Bobcat. And then, and I'm like, awesome. That's cool. 
Next thing I know, he's like, dad, you got to come over. We're having Bobcat tacos. And he legitly brined and slow cooked and made pulled pork or pulled Bobcat tacos. And if you've never, I suggest you do because they're amazing. Huh? Well, they yeah, like pulled pork. They're great. They're great. So, yeah. So now I've got him fully converted to traditional archery. In fact, I think he's hunting right now. Well, <laughs> not now, now, but he was hunting this evening. Like, I, I can't. Yeah. So, yeah, it's he's been that way since he was little. But now with the trad stuff, he's really, really gotten addicted to it. But yeah, we'll see. I, I think he's going to stay. I think we've got one hooked from now on. But yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> he, he, yeah, we saw his picture come rolling through in the uh, yeah. on close trad kill 2020. So right on. Yeah. So, yeah, he provided the pulled tacos and they were really good. So it was one of those deals. But no. So that's what started my interest in this stuff was bow hunting and being in the woods and being out there because I've never had anything unusual happen to me ever. Like I'm really boring and plain. And so anytime I get these stories, of course, you know, that's what drew me to them as a child all the way up into as an adult is I'm just drawn to the stories of these hunters that have these things happen to them. And the sad thing is, is us as hunters is we love to judge each other and compare ourselves to one another. And it's, you know, it gets rough. And I mean, it, it goes, you know, from rifle hunters to muzzleloader to compound to trad to self bow to where it just goes and goes and goes to where there's always this infighting. And I think it's one of those things. It's too, it's very easy when you hear these encounters that other hunters have had is you laugh it off as that guy obviously doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what he's looking at. He didn't really know what he was seeing. He's not as smart as me in the field. And it's real easy to pass judgment when it'd be, you have to sit back and think if it was to happen to you, how would you think everybody would want to talk about you? You wouldn't want to be, Hey, I don't, it's, it's not that I don't know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing and I know what I saw. So I have to, you want to approach those with things like that. When you think about these encounters, because like I said, I've talked to people that have had alleged encounters and whether it was real or whether it wasn't affected them the exact same way. So one of the stories that's always stuck with me took place in Arkansas that had a, a bow hunter actually had it happen to him in a ground or in a tree stand. And I will never forget this because the long and the short of it was this dude packed in early one morning, climbed up there to get in his tree stand. And from what I remember, he couldn't get it too high off the ground from where his stand was. It wasn't like he was way up. Like he was about 12 foot up in a lock on stand and just hunting this little area there along. Not, I think he had actually, when I'm, Thing, but I think he'd came in on a kayak, got out I, somewhere right in there. But anyway, he had got out, but he was going in there to hunt, uh, hunt deer and said while he was in the stand way before daylight that he thought he could see a couple of pigs at first thought he's like, there's some hogs coming. Right. And he goes, he goes, then I noticed that they were too big. Of course, so what he's talking about, he, for them to be pigs. So he's like, well, whose cows are loose in here on this little hunting refuge thing. You got to, you know, you get drawn out for to go get on. So he's like, there's no way somebody put their cows on here. And he said, of course, he hears all this. And the, the greatest story is his bow is in his lap. Broadhead sticking out. It's a muzzy broadhead. The sun's not up. So, you know, it's still just the moon shining, all of this stuff. He says, as he sees these two big objects moving around down there, he kind of hears them going around behind him. He doesn't think anything of it. And he feels something brush his leg. And what he sees brush his leg is the forearm of something big that reaches up and a big black shiny hand grabs at that shiny flicker that's on the end of that arrow. So whatever this thing was grabs, the story goes, a muzzy broadhead. And when it does, of course, it squeezes down and they, they, he, the fellow that had it happen says, there is some sort of yell or something that comes from beneath him that he describes louder than a truck horn, that it's just roaring. And he said so bad, he started screaming. So this guy starts screaming. There's a roaring from beneath him. He's freaking out. He said, by the time he's not even moving, everything, the whole forest went psycho. He says, this thing moves off or whatever it was. It gets, finally gets daylight. He says, when it gets daylight enough for me to see, I'm gone. So he bounces, never did find out what it was, but reported that it looked like a giant, almost like a baseball glove sized hand, reach up and grab his broadhead. Now I ask you this, what could it have possibly been? 
Is it a bat? And he imagined it flew in there and hit it. But what's making the screaming sound? So either this story is something that is completely unnerving that you don't really want to think any deeper about, or it's a total lie. But either way, how can they all be total lies? So like I said, these guys are having really creepy things happen to them while they're out in the woods. Now, do you know where Elk Valley Road is, Rob? It's in Bear Lake County. That helps any. Oh, Bear Lake County. Uh, that's that's way south, all the way to the opposite end of the state. Down in there? Yeah. Well, back in 81 or 82, there was actually a sighting that took place in Bear Lake County down there. Uh, a fella took his head like his dad, some of their family with them. And they were down on Elk Valley Road. And, of course, they go to spreading out while they're down there. And they even named this place was known as Bloody Bucket. So that sounds like a fun place to hunt. So I want to come up there and hunt Bloody Bucket with you. But what they go on to see is they make their way down towards a pond. And while they were down there, they saw three men standing around this pond, a little beaver pond. And they said they don't understand why they were standing there. They're like, look, it looks like they're wearing snowmobile suits, which was weird because they said it was actually early September when they got there. As they got closer they realized that it wasn't suits, that it was fuzzy, like heavy hair all around them. Now they didn't have, of course, any camera with them, but they got within a hundred yards of this thing before or these things, before they realized that it looked like a family of what they said had to be Bigfoot. There's no other way that they could, they could actually describe it other than a large hairy family. <laughs> so what do you dig? Well, a large yeah. hairy family? Well, I well, yeah, it really makes you want to walk in your tree stand or, you know, be able to you know uh, you know walk. You know where East Side Road is? East where, Side where? Road, East River, Idaho. Oh, yeah. East Side Road. Yeah. Spring. All right. Well, actually, it was February of this year. I, hey, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Um, so East Side Road, you know, any of Northern Idaho, East Side Road included, um, that is that is very similar to uh pacific i mean it is part of the pacific north northwest i mean we're some some people call us the inland northwest but just so you know i mean the vegetation the climate it's it's very similar to um uh to the pacific northwest where mo a lot of these sightings occur that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense then but the way these people are talking about some of this stuff in here because what they're talking about is a logger this fellow was a logger and said for 15 minutes, he sat and listened to this thing scream in a deep, low voice, so much so that he said whatever was making these sounds, the dogs wouldn't even go outside. It was at 11 p.m. at night when all that stuff went down. So whatever it was was out there calling to something so loud that he's like, I don't know what this is, but it's like nothing I've ever heard of. And he's like, I've lived here my whole life. <laughs> So, and there there's, and that was the most recent, like I said, with you, dude, there are some in that area that go all the way back to 1967, where one was actually spotted. At least the story goes that one was spotted on, let's see, Bonner's Ferry, uh, the road to Bonner's Ferry from Spirit Lake. Bonner's Ferry to Spirit Lake, Bonner's, Bonner's Ferry to Spirit Lake. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how those two tie together. So, and that's what, well, let's see here. Uh, You'd have to yeah, go through. Show. Yeah. They're, they're a long ways apart. But this fella talks about driving down was about 15 miles away from, I'm supposing here, Spirit Lake, whenever they saw something that he believed at first was just somebody messing around, right? Just like, well, who's some out in the middle of the road in the middle of nowhere till they got up there and said, he doesn't really give us a, a height size, but talks about it being a bipedal mammal with long hair from head to toe crossed in front of them so while you're kicking around up there, <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm not this ain't a good idea <laughs> well and that's the exactly or when they do take them why, why is it that nobody like can ever have a camera he used to always say that bigfoot just looked for buzz uh blurry that was his natural look was the blurry look and they do man there are tons of pictures and video out there but again it's nothing enough to make it believable so you see these and you're like, yeah, I could see how it could be real. And then I could see how this picture could be faked. It could be a complete and total hoax. Just like the Patterson Gimlin film. You watch it the first few times and you're told what it is. And you're like, well, I guess I could see how that looks like. Yeah, that could be a Bigfoot. And then you start watching it and really paying attention to it. And you're like, well, no, actually, it looks like maybe it is Bob Hieronymus. You know, like maybe it really is a dude in a suit. 
And then you go back and like you go back and forth on this whole thing. I don't know. The, the problem I have with everybody that says they know is these things have been talked about for hundreds of years. There are all kinds, over 600 names for it in all of all the Native American languages. And that this stuff has been discussed off now, of course, you know, Grover Krantz thought it was Gigantopithecus. Maybe it could have been a leftover uh, species still of them around here. I have no idea. I mean, what they describe as Gigantopithecus and compared to what they talk about as Bigfoot really doesn't look like, you know, it looks like two completely different things. But then you have sightings of these things all over the world. You talk about coming from Australia, they're the Yaoi, you know, they're the Yaren in China. They're uh, what, the Orang Pendak in like Thailand. So you, there's all these different places and they're roughly not exactly the same, but they, they kind of all fit almost geographically where they would be. Like you start talking about, you get into Florida, they're the skunk ape. So they're known to be smaller. They're not quite the same size as the Bigfoot that are reported in the Pacific Northwest. You come out here in Texas, in East Texas, up into Arkansas, which is where the Beast of Boggy Creek and the Falk Monster, all that started. They're even known to have three-toed tracks. So it's, it's, so if it is all bull crap, they're doing a really good job of mixing up these stories and building all this stuff together to make the folklore continue all for fun. I mean, hats off to you, whoever is still coming up with all this, if that's what it is. It is, it is tough to, uh, it is tough to imagine how, <clears throat> how similar stories all across the world for hundreds of years uh, you know, Native Americans and, and, uh, uh, you know, just like you're saying, different continents, similar stories. And what's so hard for me to imagine is how one of us with a game camera, a, you know, any kind of game camera out there hasn't caught definitive proof, how somebody in the back country hasn't had definitive proof. You're sitting on the edge of a mountain a glass in a valley, you would think there's no way that thing would know you was even out there and you would see one out there and be like, well, I'm fixing to go ahead and make the shot of a lifetime and collect my, of course, you're going to get a lot of hate if you're the man that killed Bigfoot, but you're also going to get a lot of folding money if you're the man that killed Bigfoot too. <laughs> well, so, I mean, like it's hard. You can plug your ears with thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> That's real easy. So I'm always in that camp of like, how come somebody hasn't had like, this distinct, like, what is it, phone scope, where you mount the thing on your, you know, and then look through your phone down on your, your spot and scope. Nobody's got video of that. But then we get these stories time and time again, and people come forward and they have tracks and they have encounters with them. And you're like, look, man, I don't know what would possess anyone to make up a huge story like this with nothing to gain for it other than to be judged. And then just leave. No money, no anything. You just come forward, tell your, you know, your encounter, and then went back to your house and you never wrote it. Somebody finally put it online somewhere. And that's it. Like that's no other reason other than just be like, well, I think I'm just going to try my hand at making one up. I mean, either you're a liar or you're not. I mean, it's not like you don't just dabble with writing a crazy story about Bigfoot and then go about the rest of your life like nothing ever happened. Like it just, it's weird that how we have such little proof other than, then of course, and it's, they're notoriously unreliable, but it's true. Firsthand accounts is really all we have. Well, I would, uh, I would get my butt kicked by Kenny Marquardt. If I didn't ask you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit ago. Uh, if you see Bigfoot, are you going to shoot him? I am 100% in the, you must kill it camp it gets a lot of hate and there's a lot of camp. There's it, that's really what divides the Bigfoot community is <laughs> do you kill it or do you not? Uh, I'm looking for the fact that if you're going to prove anything is scientifically real, you need a specimen. It doesn't matter what it is. You need a hard copy. To All, right. Show. All right. So, so you're going to kill it now. Jack links beef jerky. What? <laughs> that's how they so catch them on TV. So, okay. So you say, so you're sitting in a tree stand and mm -hmm. you see something coming and it's Easy now big dog now, you're talking now about with a recurve. Now, now, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, even with a gun, but you see them coming. There's three of them. It appears to be a male, a female and a baby. Oh, the male's done. <laughs> really? You're going to let that oh. baby be fatherless. 
Ah, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He's probably not a good dad anyway. Don't he doesn't, give him, he doesn't give him all the mushrooms. He don't like. He don't like. He don't split fish with him. Look, folks, y'all are gonna get mad at me. I'm just kidding. We don't. Even, you're gonna get mad at me about an unknown creature. I'm like, come on, man, settle down. I don't have any idea. It's just stories. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm for real. There have been people that have come forward with encounters where they claim to have had the opportunity to kill Bigfoot. We've spoke to these people face to face, and I will tell you a story right now that took place in the panhandle of Texas, about three hours from here on a deer lease that I was on years and years ago. And a fellow that I hunted with had an encounter on this deer lease uh, during spring turkey season. I was in my early 20s at the time. He, we had gotten there late, my brother-in-law and I, we'd gotten there late. When they finally, the fella came in, because we didn't go out that evening for the, the hunt, but when that, that dude come in way early, started loading up his things, put his four-wheeler in the truck, didn't say anything to anybody. We were over there cooking. He didn't say anything to anybody. He starts loading up, go over and be like, hey, dude, what's going on? He wouldn't even talk about it. Everybody was like, why are you leaving? What happened? Why are you going home? I just got to get home. I just got to get home. And he would never, you know, you can instantly tell somebody's hiding something. Like, what are you embarrassed of? We finally got him to stop long enough, and he was defensive, and he told us what he had seen. He was out there with his rifle. He's pig hunting. He said, I wasn't even caring about uh, turkey. He doesn't even hunt turkey. He was just down there to pig hunt. And he claims that he saw something pushing its way through some cedars on a little cedar break. And he at first said, I thought it was an old cow just out there just moseying through the brush. He said, it wasn't until I realized this thing kind of stands up through the cedars and they're hitting him in the armpits. And these are like six foot tall cedar trees. And he said, this thing is pushing its way down this ridge. And he said, I'm looking at it with binoculars. I've got my rifle leaned right up in the corner. And he said, I watched this thing go down the part of this ridge off into a draw. Like, so he was like, I lose sight of it. I keep watching. I finally catch movement of it again in the bottom, a little further out this whole time. Now, when I say far, I'm talking like, I think it's like about 300 yards. He was looking at it when he first saw it. And he said, it made its way down and went off into an old river bottom down there. And he said, when it got out of sight, I got down, got in his stuff and he left. And I'll tell you how much it affected him. He sold all of his hunting gear. He sold his boat, all of his fishing gear. He never went back into the woods and he died from a massive, uh, from cancer seven years later. And he never once changed his story. And he never once went back into the outdoors, completely changed him a hundred percent. And his whole story was there are things out there that you can't understand and we can't deal with. And that's what he left it at. So I have, again, I know and knew that fella personally and had something happen. Thinks what it would take either one of you. Think about what it would take to scare you so bad that not only would you just be like, well, I'm not going to hunt the rest of this week. You're not going to hunt ever. And you're going to take every bit of hunting gear that you have and sell it. And you never go into the woods again from one encounter. Would you make it up? Hmm. My girlfriend might dress up as Bigfoot and be running around out at the farm. <laughs> Don't let her do it around Cam. He's shooter. <laughs> she's she's going to contact me in a minute and be like, hey, can you send somebody out there to scare Blake? <laughs> it's, it would save me money in the long run. <laughs> no, so, I mean, it's always uh, like that I can't get behind because I'm like, I don't know what is. And that's what I, I have to tell everybody when you start ever before you ever listen to it because we get inundated all the time oh this guy believes in this and believes in that and i'm like no dude i'm just going with the stories i don't know what's going on i wish i could have some sort of anything i wished i could see something in the sky i wish something weird would happen so i could at least have an opinion but as of right now i'm just kind of researching i'm just keep going through the motions so cam what else do you have in uh, bonner county Okay, so let me ask you this. Do you know where Coolin, Idaho is? Oh, yeah. Yep. The nearest road, it says here, is Highway 2. Well, e down there east by side, Priest Lake. Yeah, east side road. Uh, that all ties in right up there. Is, is Priest Lake all like a national forest or something? It's all public hunting land? Um, yeah, it's a lot of state. Um, okay. It's very, very remote. Just north of there is... Uh, uh, British Columbia, right on the Washington border, uh, big, thick, uh, big, thick timber. 
that makes that makes sense of what they're talking about here because apparently it was a uh, a person and their father and some friends was on a hike uh, up from Lying Lionhead. Apparently, up to there's some wigwams up there. Yep. So down by Kent Lake and then down to Lion Creek and then out they say at the rock slides at Priest Lake. So it's like a two day hike. Mm-hmm. And apparently on the second day they were about seven miles in on Lion Creek, around where there's apparently a bunch of uh, animal trails and they started noticing tracks. And what they ended up finding was footprints that were seven to nine inches wide and about 16 inches long. And they followed, they said it, a long little list of them down through there. It wasn't just like two or three. They were several that had gone down through there. And that's what they had ended up seeing. So apparently there's a lot of footprints and activity down around Priest Lake. Y'all need to get down there and find some Sasquish. That's what you need to go find down there. What you call baby Sasquatch, Sasquirts. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's actually uh, considered, I think it's considered bur- boreal forest. Oh, for real? Yep. Part, parts of that. Yep. So, yeah, that is thick and remote down in there then. And it makes sense. You keep saying down in there. Yeah. It's up in there. That's not up in there. Uh-uh, like uh-huh. You want to be down in the bottom. You don't be up in the top. <laughs> so, so, so you're going to shoot the male. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, the female, she might get a little pissed off. So what you're telling me is I'm going to have to just massacre a whole family to prove it. It's alive, huh? Now I have to kill the whole family of them. You're so who are you? Shoot, which one are you shooting first? You're going to shoot I don't know what I'm going to shoot. I don't know what I'm going to shoot. Oh, or what camp are you in? Are you in the live, live and let live camp? I don't know, man. I don't know. Man, you'd hate to make a Blake, bad shot Blake, on one. You should think, hate first and ask questions later. See, I can tell you where Blake's from. See? <laughs> He's an hour from me. That's where Blake's from. Both of us are like, we're going to start shooting. And then we're going to go there and find out what happened. I'm going to set my beer down. Yeah, when the dust settles, we'll be like, turn those big lights on on the top of the truck. That's Let's right. Yeah. I'm going to get out the Pulsar. Let that Creedmoor eat. I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah. Big so- Not today. Yeah, because that was we make these jokes all the time talking to one another. It's like, would you shoot Bigfoot? And I'm like, yeah, man, you would have to. But then there's also, like we said, that part of you, that people report that it is so human that they can't do it, much like the, the person that I was on the deer lease with, same way. It's like it, there's just something. Ab- I don't know if it's the fact that it's because they're so human looking or if it's the fact that you are seeing something that in your mind and in your soul you have never thought to be true. You are witnessing something that is truly remarkable and life-changing, and you can't even process what's going on. It's kind of like when people freeze up. Like, you'll see people in a car wreck. They just freeze. You know, oh, everything went in slow motion. I couldn't hardly – it's like you're. It's like you can't process everything because it's all too much sensory overload. And that's also – and we're not even going down the path of what a lot of researchers – like, we can start getting into the whole semantics of – is Bigfoot a real flesh and blood creature? Is Bigfoot an in- interdimensional being? Is Bigfoot brought down here from space and aliens? I mean, there are all these different camps when you start getting into the Bigfoot community that people think otherwise. That people think, well, it's not real. It actually can see in the dark. It has infrasound, so it can actually make noises and put these different sound vibrations and waves off that can cause you to be confused or be scared. There's all of these tales and all of these different encounters where people are talking about different things to where there's enough that you can start dividing them up to where we saw Bigfoot and we saw lights in the sky, or we saw this and we saw Bigfoot or we saw, and it starts getting to where you're like, look, this is getting so outlandish. Like we're getting away from, We've got to start working. And if it's there, where would it be? Like there's, I'll I'll give you a, for instance, there's old stories that come from Mount St. Helens in 1982 when it erupted. There's all these stories of uh, National Guardsmen helping uh, clear out like, uh, they would find it like, let us say a whole, maybe two or 300 dead elk. So they have to go in 
and haul these things out of here, load them up in the trailers and haul them out of here. Or they would find it where it was just where they were just overcome with everything there. So as they're going through it, they're finding all these animals and the animals. And then there were stories of they start finding Sasquatch and that they were finding families of Bigfoot and remains of these things and that they were loaded those on the trucks and that some of them were actually alive and were taken in by the military or taken in by whatever to help them get better because the whole story goes as far as Bigfoot as that it is an active conspiracy cover up by the logging industry and the American government because they know that if the word was to get out that there was an indigenous species of sub hominid in North America and that that's where they lived much like they've lived for thousands and thousands of years that it would shut down millions upon millions of acres of logging access and national park and national forest access because now you have to turn it into basically a reservation for Bigfoot that's his preserve is where Bigfoot's going to live and so the story has always been that this is an active cover-up for these creatures so it's another one of those crazy ideas is like well maybe it is maybe that's what is going on who knows so do you have any good missing hunter stories Oh, dude. Yeah. Which, yeah. And you know what? There is several good books out on missing people, tons of them that are just like, you know, regular ones, but there are some that are written specifically, I guess you could say for us. What's funny is when I tell you this and Blake, you'll really understand this. The people that are more likely to go missing without a trace are roughly, I would say, it looks like about the age from 25 to 55, male bow hunters. They are the ones that when they go into the mountains and they do go missing, they go missing like for good, for good. Like these guys are super gone when they're gone. Now, and I mean like nothing. Like there was, well, I'll ask you this. Rob, do you know, And because I have no idea how big Idaho is. I'm guessing that we could probably drive across it in two or three hours. I don't imagine it's real big, so. I don't, I don't know. How big is Idaho, Rob? Well, you're talking just the panhandle. You could drive two, two and a half hours. But uh, you start to get south, and you have – there's not a lot of roads going through the middle of Idaho. I got you. Which would take a long time. You have, to, you have to pack it in. Where is Laidlaw Corral, Idaho? Boy. Um, it's apparently north of Burley, Idaho. Okay, so – that's down in the uh, that's down in the southern part of Idaho. Oh, I got you. Okay, well, that back in 1996, there was a fella named Richard uh, Bendel. He actually he was 29 when he went missing on a hunt. So on November 17th, Richard went back into the back country. Well, he drove his truck. He had him a Chevy pickup. Drove his truck back into an area on a hunt. He was going to go hunting, and ended up breaking down back in this area. But what it was, it sounded more like his battery had kind of give out. So he has his phone, calls his mom, says, hey, look, this is what's going on. This is where I'll be. While he's talking to her, he gets disconnected. So she kind of panics like a mom does and should do. And she calls the sheriff's department. So the sheriff's department head out first thing in the morning. So, you know, they're like, okay. So they get out. And, when, and like I said, when all this is going down, it's like two or three in the morning. They start going out there. They're like, we got to go find him. We don't have any idea what's going on. So they go out there and they find his truck. Now, the really weird thing about this is the truck had gas in it. So they were like, well, it didn't run out of gas. So it had to have been probably more than likely electrical whenever it went out. So they go through the entire vehicle, searching all that stuff. Can't find any trace of him. Go all around this whole thing. It's just parked like out into like some forest land, just parked there. Goes around this whole thing. So they bring up helicopters. They bring in tracking dogs. They start that next day with three tracking dogs. They go through this whole deal. Then the weather starts getting kind of iffy. Now, what you'll notice is, and this is a very weird thing about certain missing people stories, the weather always, of course, you know how fast it changes in the mountains, but it always seems to get real sketchy the minute they get ready to, almost like it's planned, the minute they get ready to have a search and rescue. So they bring this in and they have some wild stuff go down there. So they ended up bringing in, three or four sets of dogs when the weather lifts like 35 SAR members and they start searching that entire area and they search that area I want to say for almost a week they went through there and they could never find anything they could never find any place of where he might have went off to there was no place to hitchhike to 
from where he was at. There was really no place. They went everywhere you could possibly go. And they said that they, they couldn't even find a scent trail. Like the dogs picked up nothing, nothing from that truck. They said it was as like, like the world just opened up and swallowed him standing right there beside the pickup. And he was just gone. And that's not the only one from Idaho. They was a, a, a fellow. This fellow was a Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. That word state trooper. And he had come back there in 2008. His name was Ronald Gray, and he was in the Nez Perce National Forest. And Vietnam veteran, the whole thing. And he ended up going missing pretty much the same way. The wild thing was is he had uh, survival gear with him, had his pack, had food, pretty much had every, anything and everything you could imagine that you would needed, and completely went missing. And those guys, they brought in SARS. They brought in helicopters. They had they searched for two weeks, 8,500 square miles of that area, and they found nothing. And as and this was back in 08. And as of today, they have still been no reports and no gear or no anything found of him. Just again, like the world just opened up and swallowed him. And those stories aren't few and far between. There are dozens of stories where dudes just go out there, go hunting and either vanish completely or when they do find them, they find them miles and miles away from where they were supposed to have been or where the, the look even where they were even looking. There are tales of people that would go missing. They would bring in the dogs, bring in the SARS team, search a whole area, look. And then three or four days later, they find the body in the area exactly where they were searching. And what I mean within like, a thousand yards of where they'd been searching or within a thousand yards of the camp. And they were like, there's no way that body's been here for two or three days. We've been all over this place. And yet here's the body. So they don't even know how it ends up getting there. And it's not just missing hunters. It happens to kids. There's a lot of kids that go missing and they will find those children that may have walked barefoot like nine miles over rivers and up on top of mountains. And they find like, you have no idea. And they, if they're found alive, they can never, they don't remember. They don't tell you anything about how they got there. It is very, very, very mysterious. Now, there's one that took place in Maine, Rob, and I thought you might enjoy this in Jackman, Maine. Oh, yeah. This took place, though. This is one of my favorite stories, if nothing else. It's not necessarily because of what happens if you can have a favorite missing hunter, missing person story, which is probably not a good thing to say you've got. But this took place in 1930. What was interesting about it is the fellow named Mitchell Kaufman. Mitchell Kaufman. So you have to imagine this. The Converse Rubber Company was from where? Malden, Mass. Right? That's where Converse originally started. So in 1917, the Converse introduced the all-star tennis shoe. Well, and it ended up being one of the best ones. In fact, it's named after the sales team leader, Charles Taylor, was the man that it was named after. The reason I tell you all of that stuff is because in 1929, Converse hit some rough patches. And the Hodgman Rubber Company president took over and became president of Converse. And that man's name was Mitchell Kaufman. So Mitchell Kaufman at 37 years of age, well, actually, I think he was like 32 when he became president of not just Hodgman, the waiters and all the rubber there, but of Converse. So he liked to hunt as much as all of us do. And so that's what he did. So in 1930, him and some buddies of his, uh, of course, these buddies were from Boston, they went to Northwestern Maine and they went on a deer hunt and they actually went with a few guides to a place called Cracker Pond north of Jackman Mass, right? You know where we're talking about? Jackman, Maine. Yeah. Man, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yep. one. You know where Crocker Pond is? No, no. I just wonder if that, I didn't know if it was a big place or whatnot that's, you know, like a, a national park area that you could go to or whatnot that's up there. But anyhow, so they, all it basically was was four dudes that wanted to get away from their wives, go drink some whiskey, play some cards, and hide out in a, in a camp, and well, I, act like they were going to hunt. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, that's big country. Is it? Oh, 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 hell yeah! That's uh, that's big, thick country up there. Yeah. Well, so that's they just wanted to have like a guys' weekend, but they had hired these guides, right? So these guides are like, man, we're not doing anything to help Mitchell and the guys out. Like we're we're getting paid. And we're just sitting here. So they started feeling bad about it. So one of the stories, of course, it, since it's been so long ago and there's a bunch of wild stuff. So one of the stories goes that they get Mitchell and the other guys talked into, hey, let's go hunt. Let's break up. You know, let's two for one. And let's get out here and do a little hunting. So they split up. 
Well, one of the stories is that, that some of the guys took a boat that was down there on Crocker Pond and they went across it to meet up or whatever later. Well, Mitchell decides he's going to go out on his own and circle around, kind of meet him on the other side. Well, they get separated. They never see Mitchell again either way. So they start in the next morning. They all start looking for him. So they leave the cabin. All their buddies go. The guides go. Everybody's out there. Six fellas split up, and they just start going as much as they can. Well, one of them decides he comes back and decides, I'm going to get the sheriff. So they go and get the sheriff come back. So on day two, you got all six of those dudes going and the sheriff and getting all these people together and freezing rain sets in. So again, there's crappy weather going the whole thing. So the freezing rains on them, they're trying to find all this stuff. Now this is in November at this stuff up there while it's going down. They go through all of this. They look and look and look. They bring out so much converse themselves starts paying large sums of money to get planes to come out and fly. They get three planes to start circling these areas and start low flying looking. They also bring out a bunch of bloodhounds. So Converse spares like no dimes at all. They're just sending everybody they have to go find them. And they're getting no luck. They're looking, they're like, well, maybe he went a little further than we thought. Now, the funny part of the story is if there is one is they said Mitchell had a gun, had a compass, had fresh water all around him, had matches. They know that in his pack he had enough that he could have stayed out there. And they said at the time that they were hunting, that small game was everywhere. They were like, it would be no problem to eat, to do whatever. So the guys get an idea. They start building brush piles on top of high points out there. So they build these massive brush piles, start setting them on fire. They were like, that way, anywhere he's at, he's going to see these burning brush piles. So they start setting them up there for people. And all through the night, all you see are burning brush piles. They said, surely he'll either walk to these brush piles or he'll start shooting and we'll be able to hear him. This keeps going on, going on, or almost around the clock for three weeks before they're like, man, we're not, there's nothing. Like we can't find him. We don't know anything about where he's at. So they keep going. So they end up the whole family. Of course, they come back the guys that were there with him and they go through the ringer because now they're being questioned as if they're responsible for Mitchell's murder. So these guys start getting put through it of like, you know how this goes, where they're going to bring you in there and put the bright light in your face, hit you with the rubber hose, whatever they got to do, you're going to tell them what's going on up there. And so that's what went through it. And it was apparently pretty hard on all of his buddies because they're trying to tell them, Hey, look, this is, this isn't us. We just want to find, you know, our buddy. Now you have to imagine you fast forward. I want to say it was almost two full years and his brother-in-law, they hired a private investigator to help him out, but his brother-in-law Mitchell's brother-in-law decided that he was going to take his time and, and spend all of his time looking for him. And so anytime that there was weather where he could go, he would go out there and look and they ended up finding his body up near Quebec, I believe is where it was at when they actually located it. And that it was the crazy thing was that it was on top of a pile of brush. And so of course they brought him in, went and did the whole thing. But from what it sounds like is he was laying when found flat of his back up in the middle of a pile of brush elevated up off the ground with all of his gear laying around the side of that pile of brush. And he had been there. What looks like the entire time. Like it looked like he had passed not, not too long after he had, had left the whole place. And they have no idea why. They have no idea how he didn't shoot. Like why would you crawl up in the brush and prostrate yourself out, spread eagle just on your flat of your back? They have no idea why any of these things. But that is another one of a strange story. And like I said, there are hundreds of these stories of missing people. There is a story out of, Mex out of, out of New Mexico, and I cannot – for the life of me, remember the fella's name, but it was the same type of thing as he was. And here's, what's really wild. is like, you'll have people go missing that can't get that far from the road. He was bow hunting with some friends, but he had had like a bad knee or a bad hip and he couldn't go as far as his buddies were. So he was only going to go like a couple hundred yards from the truck. He told them, I'm going to sit here and hunt. And then when y'all get back doing y'all's hunt, I'll just be right here. Just honk and I'll come up. So they come back and honk and he don't show up. They honk some more and wait, and he don't show up. So they go off into a little cluster of trees where he said he was going and they look and look, and then they go back and get the sheriff and they bring out the saw and the whole thing. And they, this dude was literally 200 yards from the truck and they've still never found him. 
no remains, no anything. He walked into, and they, his friends that were there said, we watched him walk to this spot. We knew where he was going to be. He had hunted there before. Same thing, up and vanished. Same thing as a story about an old fella that's uh, like a 77-year-old man had the same thing happen to him in Colorado, was up there hunting with family and uh, said he was going to go sit over there in this little boulder patch because he couldn't go far from camp. It was only about 150, 200 yards from camp. And he walked around there and sat on that boulder patch, and that was the last time anybody saw him. They looked, and they brought it all in. They were like, it's not like a young man that's going to be able to get out there, and if he starts losing his mind, can just go in one direction for miles and miles. This is a 77-year-old man with bad knees and a replaced hip, probably not the best ticker in the world, and it gets dark. How far is he going to go? How, you know, where are you going to go out there? How far can he actually travel physically? A mile? In any direction, that's if it was decent, easy walking in the dark. And why would he? At that age, why would he do it? He knows not to go anywhere. Then everybody's like, well, maybe he had a stroke. Well, maybe he did, but then physically he's still now limited. So how far could he travel? They've never found him either. They searched for like two weeks, found no remains, gone. So there's these tales of people that go missing and literally go missing. And then, of course, you'll find them out. There'll be some where guys have gone uh, – there is a, a video on Amazon. I believe it is called the missing 411, the hunters. And there'll be tales. There's a tale of the same way of where they go in there and guys have gone missing. And then they'll find their remains a couple of years later on a ridge. And right below that ridge will be like a barn and a house where you could have easily walked right down there. But that's where they, that's where they found them. That's where the people expired. And then there's some that's even crazier than that, where people will find remains. Well, it will only be like their legs and it will be their legs broken off below the knees and their feet will still be in the, the boots, pants still around the boots, but everything from the knee up is completely missing. Just the legs, the, the clothing, the gear, all that, and, and the feet, and that would be it. Still laced into the boots they found. So it's, you never know, man. It's just, I, I, there's, again, there's no explanation. It's just weird, creepy stories. That, so, so do you, you suppose that uh, these ones that are disappearing, you think they're getting abducted? I don't know. I have no, I mean, and that's something like you just, that is again, when you get into this world of weirdness and stuff, people will argue this into circles as everybody has their own theory. Everybody has a theory of, oh, it's serial killers or, oh, it's animal predation or, oh, like it, it's abduction. It's Bigfoot. It's this, it's that. It's the fey folk. It's all of these things that they throw at it. But in, in reality, I mean, what could it possibly be? Where could they possibly go? Now, we've all probably lost game animals. And you're like, there's no way that that deer can't be right here. And you look and look and look, and then you may find the remains of it next year and be like, well, hell, that is nowhere even close to where I thought it might go. So I, un, you know, it's real easy to understand how you could misplace something in the woods and walk right by it. And maybe that it's just, you know, bad luck. But when you talk about people that are professional search and rescuers and they really are good at their job, they train, that's what they do. They all, it's the same as tactics and tips and anything else. They know what they're looking for. They know how to find it. Especially when you start talking about people that have gone missing now, because they'll bring out the choppers with the FLIR and they run FLIR helicopters at night in the mountains they're going to be able to see anything. You can send up drones at night with the FLIR and spot stuff out in the middle of nowhere. You would be able to find it. And, and so when they go missing with a, without a complete trace, it almost is like the only answer is abduction. Like, where are they going to go? Up? I mean, that's really it. Where they pull, Or down? I mean, what, do they fall into a crevasse? I mean, how many open mine pits are out there that you could possibly fall into? I'm sure some in certain states but that doesn't seem like something that would happen on the reg or it'd be happening to more people. Hmm. Where do you find this stuff? Books, people. I mean, there is, it's endless. If you're, it's like anything else, if you're willing to dig, you'll be able to find it. And then once you open the doors and people understand that you're receptive, like it is because that's what I always laugh about is there's, there's certain people Everybody will talk about like their grandmother or their aunt or something like that is, oh, she would know things, you know, or she would get these feelings or you ever picked up the phone, you know, thinking, oh, who's that? It must be my mom calling you look and it is your mom. And you've not, you know, there's all these different little inklings of feelings and stuff like that. I don't have any of that. I'm walking through life as blind as humanly possible. 
Like I can barely find my way out of my own house. That's how little I pay attention. So I have to read all these stories and dig into it because like I said, nothing's ever happened to me cool. And I love to talk to people that cool things have happened to. I mean, it's, it's, I don't ever have, I mean, I'm assuming neither one of you guys have had anything cool. You think about it. What's the wildest thing you've ever seen? Probably not really that wild compared to some of these other stories, but everybody knows someone that's like, Oh yeah, I remember that buddy of mine saw something in the sky. Or I remember somebody had told me this, or somebody said they thought they saw a ghost or they thought they heard something. I mean, these tales are around us all the time. So once people realize, oh, that dude wants to talk about it, you'll be surprised. Like we get inundated with emails. We have a, you know, a, a telephone line where they call and you can leave your story and you can send us emails and send messages and all that stuff. And then we compile it and talk about it. Yeah. It's, so it's kind of like a, uh, like a snowball. Like you see in the cartoon, you started at the top of the hill and now it's rolled till it's huge. And that's the way the stories get to you now is you just like this. I'll probably get some just from people that have listened to y'all and have something that maybe they don't want to tell somebody. And, you know, like, oh, I was out there and saw something or heard something that I can't explain. Well, I got to imagine, um, you know, and speaking for myself, something, something crazy happened. You might not, you might not uh, be too uh, anxious to, <laughs> to tell your buddies, like, uh, yeah, because they're gonna call BS on you. Well, and that's we had spoke to. Uh, well, for me. Oh, what's up? I was just gonna say, for me personally, just the way that I feel, if if I if I think I see something, I'm probably. <laughs> not going to be very inclined to tell anybody about it. Like I, I have to, I would have to know what I'm looking at. Does that yes. make sense? So uh, I think there's probably, uh, I mean, if I think back long enough, there's probably been a night or two in the tree that I've had something happen or heard something that i really couldn't explain, but uh, I guess I've never made anything out of it because uh, I'm not going to say something to, to somebody in the, I guess the closest thing I can equate a lot of this too is in my area, you hear of people seeing mountain lions all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I saw a mountain lion or, I, uh, you know, my grandpa saw a mountain lion or whatever. And I spent a lot of time in the woods and run a lot of trail cameras and I've never seen one or, and a, it, nobody ever has a picture of one. They just see it cross the road in front of them, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So I don't know. I've just, uh, I guess there's probably a lot of people who see some pretty interesting things that they're, they're just not sure what they saw and are inclined to keep it to themselves. I, I always think, and I think you're spot on, we've discussed it. And I always think that out of all the stories we get, it's probably less than 5% of the stories that are actually out there because there's so many people like that, that hear something or see something and they're not dead set on what it is or maybe they are even, and they just don't want to admit to themselves what that was. You just, cause that would be me. I would see something and be like, yeah, I didn't see that. And just play it off. Like it wasn't a big deal and just go on with it because we've all heard, like you're talking about, we've all heard things like, you don't know if it's foxes, if it's bobcats and people that don't know the sounds that some of those animals can make, you start hearing it. You're like, I don't know what the hell that is. You're like, Oh, that's, you know, it's bobcats trying to breed or, you know, whichever, whatever. Uh, the thing with the mountain lions, true. It's the same way as we hear it all the time too. And I've, I've never seen one and I've never gotten pictures of one. I know people that have seen them, you know, like you're talking about out there by my, my brother-in-law has actually had one that's been out by his place and him and my niece have both seen it each one time, but just like that cross the road, but there's no pictures of it. There's no anything of it, but yeah, I've never seen one. I'd like to, but, and we know they're there. So it does make you wonder like, well, then, if I saw something tall and hairy, I'm damn sure probably not going to tell anybody about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want no part of that. And I even talk about it, but I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm. So, because it's one of those things like it's kind of like sharks. I like to, I hate them. So I like to pretend they're not in the ocean. So at least I can go try to enjoy myself while I'm fishing. So I can't imagine like if I knew that was in the woods, I'm like, yeah, this this pretty much ruined me. I don't need to go out there now. There's monsters out there. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it, you see something like that. And I mean, you, you can, I guess people can try and be a hard ass all they want. Mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> you're sitting in your tree and a, a Bigfoot walks underneath you and uh, that'll probably make a sissy out of you pretty quick. Just close your eyes and just, you know, 
please. <laughs> With your eyes closed, just like, man, this is just not work. And all you got your stick bow. You're like, I'm really not. Do I hold low? Like, I don't even know. Like, what do I do next? Well, you know, I was thinking like shot placement, right? You, you, unless you, if they you turn broadside. Broad yeah. If they turn broadside, it's not a very deep chest, right? So uh, you get a you. I don't fr know. frontal shot. I mean, you're going to have one lung or the other. I mean, some real issues there. Would you, would you right go between for, the eyes, man? Right. Or okay. do you have to like, do you have to play it up? Like if it's a humanoid, if it's some sort of, you know, relic hominid, do you try to shoot it in the genitals, hoping that it doesn't attack? Like I have, I've thought about all this. Like, I don't know. What you know, it could be a tall guy in a ghillie suit too. You got to think about that. Be. Well, there's guys been run over and killed because they were dressed up drunk in ghillie suits trying to be a big foot and people run them down on the road. So, I mean, yeah, that's that wouldn't be a good idea around me, right? man. Do not. Yeah, <laughs> that's me. I'm like, don't scare me in the woods like that, playing like your Bigfoot. You're liable to get shot. That's probably what's going to happen. I don't oh. know what they're seeing, though. I mean, that's like well, we yeah, talked I, about I, on the show. It's I wish we'd have done this in December because for the next five weeks, I'm going to be walking <laughs> six weeks. I'm going to be walking, uh, you know, an hour and a half in the dark. Uh, I've got. Not, not far from not far from east side road yeah, they're, they're, yeah you'll be thinking twice when you go i'll send yeah. you the links where damn you can, you can. Stuff out. no i don't i don't want it that way you need to know it's there that way you don't just go well rob just went missing look like the earth swallowed him up that's <laughs> so, it it's all you now i mean it's one of those things so uh what about uh you, you ever get ghost stories hunters and ghost stories I, there are some stories that we get from hunters that are Man, I don't even, there, there's some of them that I'm like, these stories are so wild. We discuss them, but I'm like, this is an insane. There has been a story of a bow hunter that reported seeing what he called a satyr, which if you're not familiar, they're half goat, half men. So it was a man's body from the waist up with goat horns walking on its back legs. And it was, and he said, he's sitting in his bow stand and he hears something coming. He's all excited. And he sees what looks like a human figure. And as it passes through the trees, it's clear enough that he can see about a four foot tall satyr. So from the waist down, it's goat. From the waist up, it's man with like mouflon horns. Well, that, that didn't surprise me. Where was it? East Texas? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there is a place called Goat Man Bridge in Denton, Texas. Right uh, outside that's, of there. That's 30 minutes south of me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh. Oh, and there's. There's all these, well, I'll tell you this, in Thackerville, Oklahoma, back several years ago, probably oh, 10 years ago. that's right later, down the road. <laughs> they, uh, there was a fellow uh, turkey hunting, sitting out under there, had his little turkey blind up. He's got his shotgun up, and he reported seeing what he thought was a wolf. He said, it's a big black dog getting a drink of water. He said, the dog finishes getting a drink of water in this creek and stands up on, back, on its back legs. And he said, it's probably about seven foot tall. And it walks, takes a step over the creek and walks off on its back feet like a man would walk. Now, ever since all that started, there's been all these reports of what people call dog man. So dog man is a thing that's out there now. Basically sounds, and we've even interviewed uh, two fellas that had an alleged encounter with them and ended up shooting it with a pistol. And it ran off and they tracked it some in the night till they got freaked out, waited the next morning and lost the blood trail. But they said that it was about at least seven foot tall when it made its way into their camp. And that's whenever they shot it. So there's tales of dog man that hunters have seen. There's tales of what it's been coined in the form, what we actually call, but everybody calls the glimmer man. The glimmer man are other sightings that people see. So when you bring up the glimmer man, you have to think of the idea of the movie Predator. The way the Predator had that kind of clear magnified camo. That's what the glimmer man looks like. And there are multiple reports of hunters witnessing something like that in the woods, not big. Some of them are tall. Some of them are small. So they're different sizes, but there are numerous reports of people seeing those. In fact, we received one from a guy in Kentucky, I believe, where he and his, it's either his brother or his friend were actually out scouting some public land and hunting in an area there, but they were putting out game cameras and had something like that circle their camp at night. And the next day while they were hiking out, it was paralleling them for about an hour. And they said it was some sort of mirrored thing. It had a humanoid form, but it had that kind of, almost like that kind of camouflage as it would make its way either on the ground or climb trees 
and move through the trees also. So it was doing both on that whole thing. So again, another wild stories of people hearing stuff. I know a guy that saw a Bengal tiger out of his bow stand in Texas. Oh, that wouldn't surprise me. No, that's what we, now, of course, he never went back to that bow stand. He's like, I don't think so. Not unless it's daylight. It's like the last thing I need to do is be eaten by a tiger, but was sitting in his stand and out about 65 yards, he said he heard something and here come a full grown Bengal tiger, walked out, looked over at the feeder and then kept going, walked off. I said, you didn't let one fly. He's like, hell no, I didn't let one fly. Last well, thing I need the tiger coming up in the stand with you. I'd have emptied my quiver. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just walked it in. That's close enough. Oh, yeah. Going. You bet. Fred bared it. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, he got attacked by a tiger in his bow stand. No, that wouldn't surprise me. They say there's more uh, Bengal tigers in captivity in Texas than there is in the wild in the rest of the world. I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Y'all got some weird stuff going down in Texas. Well, it's a free country down here, Rob. It's great. <laughs> Just move here. Isn't that He's got a point, from, no? What was it, what was his name? <laughs> tiger guy. What was it? Tiger guy. Uh, no, Oklahoma. that's Oklahoma. Don't confuse that with Texas. Don't it's you live right I'll never do that again. Uh, no, but I do. He was talking about Thackerville a minute ago and Wolfman. I think uh, they probably got some uh, some bad weed up there or something. Oh yeah, might it. well, and you know it's not too far from the Windstar. It could easily be the Native Americans and Skinwalkers. That's another thing with the Native Americans is their folklore that gets into Skinwalkers and shaman and all of this. So there's a whole nother angle that you could take it down to. Yeah, Thackerville's ten minutes from my house, so I'm the stones throw. Nice. Got to watch out for the dog man. Yeah, yeah. These things, like I said, it's out there. And people can laugh and you can do whatever you want to do. But at the end of the day, it's still an interesting story. What, what do people pay more money to go see in the movie theaters, documentaries or Disney? Well, exactly. So it's the idea of the story. And that's all it is. We have no idea. And if you've had something crazy, get in touch with us. I'd like to know. I'd yeah. Like where, to hear where, do, where, where would people get in touch with you? The easiest way to find us is you can just Google search any search place you want to expanded perspectives. We're on all podcast platforms. We're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I think there's still a Twitter that we use. I don't know. I don't, I don't do a lot of that stuff. I like to mess with Instagram. That's about as far as I take it. But anywhere you can find us uh, or anywhere you find podcasts, that's where we'll be. If you have something you want to send it, you can go to the expandedperspectives.com. There's links to everything there. We have a phone number. We have everything there that you can find to get in touch with us. You can send us any messages that you want. If you've had a story, like I said, we love to hear it. If you've had some crazy encounter that you've never wanted to tell anybody, we'll take it. Go ahead. We're not going to judge you. We don't care. Like I said, we're just in it for the stories. That's why we're having this conversation. And that's why we get to come on and talk with these fine fellas. And it's, besides, I mean, it's all bow hunting. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Like you said, believe it or not, they're, they're fun stories. And, yeah. um, you know, it's fun to sit and sit and think about, I guess. Now, the yeah. missing people's legit course y'all anybody can do the research and find all those you can start going through any of the books any of the stuff all of that stuff's there but they are some really wild ones but it's fun because like what rob brought up uh earlier and then what me and blake of course are laughing about it's something you're going to think about walking to your stand damn straight. you can't help but do it you can't help and if i always ask if anybody out there listening has ever said you've never been scared at least once while you were out hunting you're probably fibbing to yourself there's at least one time you've scared yourself. We've all done it to where you're like, man, I don't know what's going on, but you get that weird feeling on the back of your neck. And you're like, I need to get out of here. Yeah, I've had it. I've had it before. I got lost one night and got that feeling. It was pretty, uh, pretty creepy. Just, you just want the sun to come up. I don't care what happens. I just need to see sunlight. Everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. And East Texas too. That's another thing that people forget about is the size of the, the, the timber in East Texas is second only to Alaska. So when you look at the state of Texas and you realize that all of the woods and that whole East Texas side is the second only to the state of Alaska, that tells you how many acres that that whole area is and how thick it is. And if you've never seen it, it is massively thick. And that's where the majority of the Bigfoot sightings in the state of Texas come from is all through that East Texas big thicket area. And so I've got friends that have, I've got a buddy of mine. I'll tell you one more before we get out of here. I'll let y'all go. I'll quit talking your leg off. One of one of my buddies that I've worked with quite some time lived over in Tyler and he had some friends of theirs. Anyway, they would always go fishing out there and his 
buddy came in and he's his friend said, Hey, look, I got to tell you this story. This happened about three years ago, four years ago, this guy was fishing with his dad. They were on their bass boat, just slow trolling along the banks, about 30 foot off, just flipping and pitching up into these cattails. They said, they come around and he said, man, it's probably eight 30 in the morning. He said, we're flipping and pitching. And he said, my dad goes, what is that? He said, you could see he was what I thought was a hog behind a tree. I could just see the black, you know, looks like the wiry black hair on this pig. He said, whatever it is, at, and like he said, we're 30 foot from the edge of the water. This thing's about 10 foot behind that. He said, this black thing stands up behind the tree and peeks out from behind it, looking at him. And he said, what it looks like is the hairless face of a gorilla, but more man-like. And he said, it's looking us in the face. And he said, it leans back behind the tree, steps back out. He said, this thing's probably six and a half foot tall looks us dead in the face and then turns and trots off into the brush. He said, we, both of us had, he goes, it had no idea we were coming because we were just, you know, trolling along, making no noise. We weren't talking. And he said, we spun right up on this thing. And he still, he's like, I don't know what it is. I couldn't tell you what it is. He said, if you held a gun on me, I couldn't tell you what it was. He said, the closest thing that I can tell you, and this is what we were talking about, but is he said, it feels like a gorilla. So that's what he would say is he said, I just saw a big gorilla. And he goes, no, nah, I don't know how it got there. I don't know where it came from. I have no, but he said, that's what it felt like. And so again, where's a six and a half foot tall gorilla doing in Texas? They don't really get that tall. And they don't definitely don't walk like people whenever they kind of trot off into the cattails and into the thick grass. And that's just right there. And like I said, man, there are thousands of stories of these crazy little one-off sightings like that. So all the people that listen to this and all the people that have spent time in the woods, you would think somebody would have killed one by now, but no. So again, they are the hide and seek world champion. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down undefeated. A uh, guy could have snagged him with a crankbait. Yeah. Ooh, could you imagine that? <laughs> Hit him in the back with a whopper plopper and see what happens. Yeah, that probably wouldn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> As he comes wading out to the boat. That would be uh, helpful. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I'm interested now. Uh, how many people do reach out to you? Because I'll, I'll bet, I'll bet there's a lot of stories out there. There is, and there. Uh, I mean, you can't dismiss one over the other. You can't laugh at one and take one serious. You have to look at all of them and think this person took the time to sit down, write this story, and send it and entrust it to me. I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to make jokes about it. The whole deal. I'll say, it, man, that sounds insane. And like, yeah, you know, and but I wasn't there. So if I'm not right beside you or anybody's not right beside anybody, when something happens, you don't really understand the full impact it might have. I believe I had told you that, Rob, is my favorite Bigfoot story is a hoax of all time. My favorite all-time Bigfoot story because it tells, makes this point perfectly. There was a good friend of ours named Gary Christensen, and he was an investigator here in the state of Texas with the BFRO. And we interviewed him when we first started doing our podcast. And Gary had never been interviewed before, so he had come on to tell these stories. And I asked him, I said, Gary, what is your favorite story? And he told me this, and it has since become hands down my favorite story. I believe it took place in, in North Dakota, but he was up visiting family and doing, uh, was on a pheasant hunt, I believe is how it all went when he ended up encountering some people that told him about a Bigfoot encounter that happened with a group of uh, kindergartners when this person was in kindergarten. So said, Hey, me and my class had an encounter with Bigfoot when, you know, we were kindergarten, first grade age, something like that. And he was like, I just wonder if anybody else remembers it or what had all gone on. So he had told Gary, so Gary said, you know what, while I'm up here, he's like, I think I'll ask around. So he gets some names of some people that still lived in the town with the, uh, the person that had given him the first story. So he starts going to those people and hitting them up, introducing himself, telling them what he does. That's what I'm asking. And they all start going, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. So the story was that these kids are out on the playground and Bigfoot, they hear screaming and roaring from a river bottom at the edge of where the playground was. And, of course, this is back in the day when they didn't put fences up, right? We didn't have fences around your playground. It's just the way it was. So everybody was monkeying around and playing out there and they start hearing this screaming and roaring and these rocks. And then these limbs start coming in, start flying over there and 
a Bigfoot come up out of that creek bottom, throwing the rocks and beating on its chest and throwing all these limbs, and the police show up. They called the cops. The cops show up. Cops bail out, run out there, start shooting rounds off at Bigfoot. So they get into a gunfight with Bigfoot in front of kindergarten first grade class and drive Bigfoot back into the creek and he vanishes and all the kids rush inside and this is the way it all goes. So all the people that he spoke to in that class were still to this day traumatized by the whole thing. He spoke to a woman. She's like, I don't go out at dark and, and she's in her forties and she's like, look, I don't camp. We don't do any of that. That those days ended when I was in school and this whole thing. So they talk around, they find out that one of the teachers that was there that day is, is still alive. So he goes to talk to the teacher and ask the teacher and the teacher's like, Oh, I remember all that. She's like, that was Mr. So-and-so let's call him Wilson, the, pre uh, the, the principal. And Gary's like, what? And she's like, Oh yeah, that was a joke for the kids for Halloween. And he was like, excuse me. She goes, you need to go talk to the principal. And he's like, he's still alive. And she's like, Oh yeah. So he's in his eighties. So he, Gary goes, sets up the meeting, goes to his house, sits down and said, would you tell me the story? So the principal relays the story as I've relayed to you, says, I got dressed up. We gave the, the cops blanks. The cops were in on it. This whole big shebang was for the kids for Halloween. And Gary looks him in the face and says, well, did you tell the kids later? And he said, well, not come to think of it. No, nah, I just assumed that they figured it out. He's like, you do realize that you've ruined a group of people's lives <laughs> believing this entire time that Bigfoot attacked them while they were children on their playground. The cops couldn't kill it and it ran off. That's what they believe. And he could not believe that those thoughts were still in those kids' heads. So Gary has to go back to the people he'd interviewed in that town and tell them, oh, by the way, all the things that you've believed your whole life is all bull crap. And he plays for them the interview he does with, he did with the principal. So they hear him say, no, it's all been false. So my favorite Bigfoot story is a complete misrepresentation of Bigfoot, but it makes the point that I made at the beginning of the show. It doesn't matter if the sighting was true or not. It had the exact same effect on the person the way they believe it. So again, when you start judging people about their stories, it doesn't matter if you think it's true or not. It's the person that experienced it. It's what their experience is, is how it affects them. So this whole time, these people had no idea it wasn't real, but they lived their lives like it was. And that's why they didn't need fences around the school. That, that is no Wait, Can you think about if somebody fired off blanks around school children now? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. That's a great point. <laughs> That'd be on the front page of CNN. That would be bad. Yeah, that would be real bad. But yeah, so there, yeah, there you go. My favorite Bigfoot story. It's not even real. Man, that's a pretty good I one. I got, I, I appreciate, we've been talking about getting together and doing this and it's actually, yeah. it was your, your idea. Let's do it for Halloween. I, this was a yeah. great idea. It was a great it's, idea, man. It's just fun. It's like we said, it's just fun. And I hope, I hope somebody out there listening has some strange encounters this season. Come on. Nothing too scary. I don't want anybody to go vanishing and no missing or nothing, but maybe I'll see something scary. Come on, everybody. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to just wait till daylight now and, and my excuse is going to be the winds will settle. That's what I do. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to be in the stand at dawn. Truck blind. Don't, don't want to bump them out of their bed. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to bump them out. No, <laughs> Why are you hunting so late? Ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to set my feeder for 1130 and two o'clock. Yeah, and you'll look at birds underneath it. <laughs> You're like, well, good, uh, out there. well, good luck the rest of your season, Cam. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Trust me. Oh, me and you both, buddy. <laughs> me and you both. Yeah, so, so where, where, where can up? they find you again? All right. any Anywhere y'all want to look up expanded perspectives. Like I said, I, we, I dump it on YouTube, and then anywhere you've – getting this podcast, just putting the search bar expanded perspectives. You'll see our logo looks like Bigfoot's like Washington crossing the Delaware. And it's got all kinds of wild stuff in the logo. That's how you'll know it'll be us. So then you can find it. And like I said, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's on Twitter. You can find it anywhere. You can reach out to me and I got my own Instagram and all that stuff too under Cam Hale. So, I mean, it's, it's real easy. You can locate me in anything. You want to chit chat about something crazy. And also too, I love to bow hunt. 
I love to, that's it. That's that's I need to go to Bow Hunters Anonymous. Well, we'll be looking for you. We'll be looking for the uh, photo of you and a a, a whole family of um, Sasquatch. Or... I think I'm going to get somebody to dress up in a Bigfoot outfit, and I'm going to have them lay out. I'm going to lay my. I'm going to send that into I Hunt Close. <laughs> my first trade. There you go. I think I'm going to do that. That's a good one. I think we'll, we'll, I don't measure we'll it like palm and his teeth. That's on his feet. You got to measure their feet and their teeth. Well, I'll tell you what. You 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 kill one uh, with an iron wheel broadhead. You'll probably get sponsored. Heck yeah, there you go. talking. <laughs> if there's a broadhead that can do it, it's the iron will. That's oh. right. Hey man, thanks for your time. Hey, thanks for letting me come on yeah. here and ramble. You thanks, betcha. Cam. We appreciate it, man. Had a lot of fun. All right. Take care. See y'all. Yeah.